Thank you, Karen. And thanks to all of you for um, gathering here today. Um, I would just start out by saying that I hope that our um, topic today about reading storybooks with children is um, one of your favorite things to do. I know it is one of mine. I thought about doing this webinar from down in the room that has all my children's books in it, so I could have those as a backdrop because I do love them. Um, and I think when um, story reading goes well, we delight in that, um, but it doesn't always. So let's do a little thinking about that. I think a starting point for a lot of us is that books are powerful. We know that books make a difference in children's lives. We also know that um, some children have difficulty um, attending and understanding the stories. So um, what books we read and how we read them makes a difference. So what we'll do today is think together about um, identifying sort of what makes a good storybook and then thinking together about how we can read those books in ways that are engaging for children and that really build their skills for being um, lifelong readers because we know um, probably for many of us that's a delight and uh, we know it's also powerful for their success in school and life. Um, I want to encourage you to sort of jump in as it feels appropriate for you to do so. Um, if you have comments or questions, please feel free to use the chat or come off mute. Um, I'm going to trust your expertise and, and, and count on that. Oh, I should also give a thank you to uh, Karen Amundsen for putting together this, um, making this uh, webinar possible. Oh, seeing Anna's asking if there's audio. Are folks hearing? Give me a thumbs up if you're hearing. Anybody? Yes, okay. All right, other folks are hearing. So, Anna, I'm wondering if it's on your end. Great, it looks like a bunch of you. The sound is there. So, um, Anna, I'm not sure what to do for problem solving with you. Maybe um, Karen can send you a message, but um, it sounds like other people are um, getting, oh, Karen suggested to log out and come back in. All right. Um, so um, that's a uh, <laughs> makes me think of reading books with children that they, that needs to be done in a way that they can see and hear well, of course, and, and we could have some things to say about that. But for today, we're going to focus on the books themselves and, and how we read them. So um, before we get into really our focus, I do want to offer you to take just a moment to settle in, feel like you're setting aside whatever else has been going on in your day, um, and I'm try to be here because when we're here together, then um, we can share our learning. And um, um, so I'll welcome you here if that give you a second for a breath or whatever helps. Though we have a lot to do, we're not gonna be in a hurry, right? Um, just as hopefully happens when we are with children and reading. So um, just as a preface, this is one of uh, six sessions that we're uh, doing here at the Illinois Resource Center uh, around literacy. This is the third one. It's a standalone, but um, you're certainly welcome to come to uh, participate in the next couple. Um, the next one actually on using information books is a really nice compliment for this one, but um, so we'd be glad to have you here. So let's just start by thinking a little bit about what we read. And so let me just give you um, a moment to think about a book or two that's a favorite for you, or maybe is a favorite for some children. And um, let's, let's put some titles in the chat or come off mute and share a few words. Um, what do you like to read? Oh, Amara puts Pete the Cat. Who doesn't like Pete the Cat, right? Got my red shoes. Oh, Piggy and Elephant. Oh, Gerald, yes, okay, yeah. Pete the Cat, Pigeon, The Snowy Day. There's a there's a classic. I'm here in Minnesota where it is currently a snowy day actually. Um, and um, that's one that connects with children's lives. Nuffle Bunny, Watermelon, uh, Dr. Seuss, Bear, oh, The Bear Snores On, The Giving Tree, John Clausen's books are fabulous. I get a chuckle just thinking about that. We have a plan. I don't think I know that one. 
I, I better write that one down. Okay. Um, we have a plan. Uh, the Hungry Caterpillar, Eric Carl books, Brown Bear, Old Lady That Swallowed Things. Yes, um, kind of amazing. She never exploded, isn't it? Yep. Eric Carl books, the illustrations are so engaging for children, aren't they? They're so vivid. Okay, so we have a second for, um, we have a plan. Marianne has Ferdinand. That's a that's a classic along with Snowy Day there, right? Chicka chicka boom boom. All right, so we have um, a really wide range of books. So we have some shared favorites around Pete the Cat and Eric Carl, um, and um, but we also have um, just really a, a diversity of titles here. And if I asked you for your second and third favorites, we'd get lots more, right? So um, this is something that that those of us who work with young children, we're just really comfortable sort of being in this space of having books to share with kids. And if I asked you sort of why we do that, you know, what's the power in sharing books? I'm sure we'd have some things to say about children becoming lifelong readers, falling in love with books. Many of us had experiences of our own as children where we had someone um, close to us who read with us. Um, many of us have passed that on to our own children. In my case, it's now grandchildren that I'm um, still delighted to have sit next to me and or sit on my lap and read. Uh, and we hope to provide some of that same kind of experience in this other setting of an early childhood program where, um, frankly, it's more challenging having I don't know how many kids you're working with, 16, 18, 20, whatever that might be, but having a group experience where um, children sit with, connect with, or engaged in a story and, and develop not only that love of story, but also the skills that go with literacy. So let's just take a minute and remember you know, what's developing between ages three and six that has an impact on, on, on lifelong literacy skills. And we can at least roughly sort those into two categories. One is what gets called code skills. Can children decode the letters and the sounds, right? So we need to recognize the letters. We need to know that those letters are associated with sounds, make those connections. Um, being uh, phonological awareness is the sort of close attention to sound and the ability to manipulate it. So that when I see Pete the cat and I look at cat, I can go ah and read cat, okay? So obviously those of us in preschool, most of our kids don't do that, but we're building the skills towards that. On the other side are comprehension skills. Those are the skills that involved in actually making meaning, right? So that when Pete the cat says, I love my red shoes, red shoes, red shoes, that we know what that's about, right? Or, um, in the, the snowy day when um, Peter goes inside his house and he has snow in his pocket and then it's not there anymore that we understand what's happened in that story. The goal of reading is comprehension, right? Is understanding the story. And usually there are um, uh, two or in, in this case, I'm going to say three skills that get named as crucial to that. One is um, simply knowing words in the language, right? Having a rich repertoire of, uh, if you're reading The Snowy Day, that you know the word slide and you know the word pocket and you, you know that, and, and um, so that we are able to understand what, um, what the words are in a story or a language being able to put those together in meaningful kinds of ways, um, complex sentences. Uh, if you take the book, <laughs> Uh, an old classic children's book, Make Way for Ducklings, did an analysis of that one time. There's one sentence in there that's 22 words long. That's a complex sentence. Okay? It takes some real oral language skills to be able to hold that sentence and make meaning from it. All right. And then finally, um, background knowledge. That is, when we know something about the subject of a book, it's easier to understand than when we don't. So the snowy day, you folks in Illinois, all your kids immediately connect with that. I was once visiting in a school in North Carolina when 
lo and behold, it started to snow outside. And the teacher took all the children to the window to point out that that stuff was snow. And that's what Peter played with in the book, because those kids didn't have that background knowledge. It was so rare for it to snow. So what we know about a subject um, that, that a book is about makes it a lot easier or harder to understand that background knowledge is really crucial. So when we read, we're relying on children developing those. I mean, it's it's kind of a, a, a two-way process. For children to be successful, they have to have some of those skills. <laughs> Excuse me. When we're reading with children, we want to build those skills. So what I'd like to think with you about is choosing books that fit different literacy purposes, all right? And I want to suggest, I'm going to sort of lay out a few different kinds of books. I'm not going to be um, comprehensive here, but, but a few of the key ones that show up in early childhood classes and think about what we use them for, okay? One genre of children's book is alphabet books. And, you know, Chicka Chicka Boom Boom is the, is the sort of classic, but there are, there are dozens of alphabet books. And those of you, if you were at the um, Learning the ABC session we did before, actually sent out a list with that of probably a few dozen different alphabet books. What are alphabet books good for? <laughs> They're good for learning the alphabet, right? They are, in many cases, actually hard books to sit and read all the way through with children, okay? And that may not be the best way to use them. But what they're really powerful for is learning the shapes of letters, learning to be able to identify letters, and making the sound matches that go with those letters. So alphabet books, let's use them for what they're really good for. Okay. Another sort of type of uh, children's book, I would call a predictable book. Okay. This is a book where children can um, figure out from the patterns in the text what is going to come next in essence in the book, all right? So brown bear, brown bear, what do you see? You turn the page and there's a yellow duck and you don't actually even have to read those words to the kids half the time, right? They simply know that must say yellow duck, yellow duck, what do you see, right? Okay, and so with those predictable books, what they're really super for is for children being able to focus on the print and use that print in order to um, uh, start to learn about letters and sounds. So um, I don't know if, um, um, well, I don't wanna go sort of too deep into that genre, but but when children can predict what the, what the book says, then if we track some of the print with them, they can go, oh, that word, must be what those words must be what do you see they keep repeating every page what do you see and i know it says what do you see so you can do some really interesting things with print using um, predictable books another genre is information books these are non-fiction books that contain information about a particular topic like this one here is building a house you can book get books about construction vehicles or penguins or any of a zillion different topics okay those books are really powerful for building background knowledge around topics they build vocabulary they also acquaint children with a genre that they're going to run into a lot later in school Okay. When you're in seventh grade, most of what you read is not novels. Okay. Most of what you're reading is one form or another of nonfiction information text. And so um, th those can be useful both for the sort of literacy skills they teach, as well as the acquaintance with a way that books are organized and function that um, they might not see otherwise. So those are all awesome. <laughs> And none of those are about what we're about today. Okay. What I want to focus with you on today is what I'm is a specific genre that I want to think about with you of storybooks. Okay. And you know, what's going on in a storybook? Of course, there's a story. And that um, that makes them different from um, from from many other books actually there's no particular story in in other books there's there, there are other things going on but what that allows us to do is focus on the kinds of comprehension challenges that come with making meaning from long 
complex, involved kinds of plots and stories. So children get experience here um, with um, hearing vocabulary that they might not otherwise. Many children are challenged by the vocabulary and stories. They get experience um, making sense of some backgrounds that they might not be familiar with. Young children really have, it's, it can be surprising and um, to us uh, and not always visible to us how much difficulty three, four, and five-year-old children have making sense of a story. You and I get the idea of cause and effect. Something happens in a story and it causes the next thing. Kids don't always get that. They don't always make those connections. Um, they, you and I can read between the lines in a story. So um, like in the story of the snowy day, it never says that the snowball melted. What you have to do is you have to look at that illustration and see that spot and go, oh, that's a wet spot from something that melted, making an inference, reading between the lines. And kids um, at young ages, this is hard for them. And so when they are engaged in these stories, there is a terrific opportunity for us to scaffold some comprehension skills. And the challenge is if, if that isn't done, they lose interest, they check out, and they start rolling around around the floor, kicking the kid next to them, and we know all the things that happens, right? So what I want to do is think with you about what makes a story a story and how we can really make use of that to be engaging with kids and build these skills. So I want to suggest to you that in a storybook, there's three things going on. One is there's a problem and a plot, okay? So in the book Corduroy, the, the problem is that here's this little bear who would really love to go home with somebody and he's got a busted shoulder strap, right? There's a button missing. And here's little Lisa who would just love to take him home. But her mom says, not today, dear, right? Don't have enough money. And besides, he's missing a button. So there's the problem. And what does Corduroy go off and do? He goes off in search of a button, right? And that's what the plot revolves around. And then lo and behold, Lisa saves up money. Ta-da, we've got a bear. Uh, uh, a bear going home with a little girl, all right? Storybooks also have characters. And, and, and I mean that in, in terms of like characters that really feel like they're characters, all right? Corduroy is this very you know, like lovable, naive, curious kind of bear. He has like he has qualities, right? And you wonder about him and you get empathetic about him and you hope it turns out okay. And oh my gosh, he fell and the lamp fell over and now he's busted by the cops. And you know, you like you really feel for this character, right? As much as we love the book Brown Bear, Brown Bear, nobody loves that bear the same way we love corduroy. That is a bear who appears once in the story and is you know, basically done. None of us are thinking, oh gosh, I wonder what that bear is feeling like when he sees the red bird. And oh, would he rather have seen the yellow duck? I mean, it's not a character in that full fleshed out sense. The other really powerful aspect of stories is that they are often rich in vocabulary. They have words in them that kids aren't familiar with. And when they encounter those words inside a meaningful context like that, then that's a powerful opportunity to learn those words. So these stories, what I want to suggest to you is that there's that they're, they are wonderful on their own. We want kids to fall in love with them but they will only fall in love with them if they understand them. And so what we can do is we can help them understand those stories by really working on three key literacy skills. Comprehension, helping them understand the, the book, okay? Vocabulary, what are those words that are going on? And, and then engagement. So what do we do so that this book is delightful for kids, all right? In the Illinois Early Learning Development Standards, goal two, is all about um, understanding and enjoying literature, comprehension and engagement, all right? Interest, understanding, making personal connections. And goal one is about oral communication, but I wanna to suggest to you that goal one is as essential to story comprehension as goal two, that 
Kids who have strong oral listening skills, I mean, understanding a story is essentially an oral listening activity, right? And so um, these will be acti um, uh, in terms of the Illinois Learning and Development Standards, we're focused on goals one and two, okay? So I wanna suggest to you that oftentimes some of the books that we will run into and that frankly, I'm gonna suggest and that maybe you've seen some pictures of, when we first look at them, they may feel too hard. And, and in fact, they are too hard if, um, for, for many kids to easily understand. The two books I have pictured here, A Chair for My Mother and The Girl Who Wore Too Much, are two books from the most popular early childhood curriculum in the United States, uh, the creative curriculum. And, you know, I've spent a lot of time working with teachers and was a teacher myself. And lots of times teachers will say, oh, not going to read those ones too hard. Okay. And so I'm agreeing they're too hard. And I want to tell you that those books were chosen by the curriculum. And I want to encourage you to choose books for your children that are actually too hard for them to understand on their own. That what, we, what we're going to try to do is choose books that are challenging. And then we are going to give kids enough support so that they can understand it. And it's um, in effect scaffolding that we're going to work slightly um, above what they can do on their own, but we're going to give them the support so that they are able to understand. I want to highlight that this is especially pertinent in classrooms with, um, um, well, in every classroom, because every classroom contains um, some degree of diversity around children's linguistic backgrounds, around their cultural backgrounds, uh, around their language skills. And so anytime we choose, uh, we think about sort of providing equity for all children, one of the things we want to do is think about, am I providing opportunities for all my kids to engage in challenging learning, even if, um, even I, if I have to work pretty hard to get them there, all right? So, Here's where we're gonna end up. What I'm gonna suggest and what I'm gonna offer is a strategy called repeated interactive read-alouds. Some of you may, may be familiar with that. Um, and in fact, there are resources on the internet um, uh, with that terminology, and I'm gonna point you towards some resources. And essentially what we're gonna do is we're gonna think about how can I plan to read a book intentionally in a way that children who might have too much difficulty otherwise can understand and do that book in multiple reads so that they gain increasing proficiency in comprehension over the course of the reads. This is especially valuable for kids who frankly have a harder time um, uh, understanding. So what I'd like to do next is I'm just gonna read you a book, okay? I'm gonna read you one that I thought maybe a lot of people would be familiar with because that's easier for us to think about. Um, the Paper Bag Princess uh, by Robert Munch. And I'm going to read it using some of the kinds of strategies that someone might use in an intentional, repeated, interactive read aloud. I'm only going to do a first read. Um, and I think I'm just going to encourage you to observe for what I do that seems effective. And if you remember, I would said we're going to focus on comprehension vocabulary and engagement. So you might pay particular attention to what do I do that supports kids in understanding the story, learning new words and staying interested. Okay, so today we have a new book to read. It's called The Paper Bag Princess. And this right here, this is a princess. Her name is Elizabeth and she has a problem. Do you see this dragon right here? This dragon came and she was going to get married and to a prince and this dragon came and stole her prince, flew away with the prince. And so now if she wants to marry him, she's going to have to go find him and somehow get her get the prince away from this dragon but that looks pretty dangerous. Dragons are pretty dangerous, aren't they? So I wonder what she's going to do to rescue this prince. His name's Prince Ronald. Oh, see right here? Look at her clothes. You see what she's wearing? 
She's not wearing fancy princess clothes, is she? Wonder what happened to her fancy princess clothes. So let's read this story and see if we can find out how Elizabeth tries to rescue Prince Ronald from this kind of scary looking dragon. And I wonder about those princess clothes too. Okay, here we go. The paper bag princess. Elizabeth was a beautiful princess. She lived in a castle and had expensive princess clothes. Expensive means a princess clothes cost a lot of money. She was going to marry a prince named Ronald. There's Ronald right there. Oh, see those little hearts? I think she's in love. Yeah, she wants to marry that prince. Oh. Unfortunately, a dragon smashed her castle. Oh, there's a dragon. And unfortunately means it was a bad thing. It smashed her whole castle. It burned off all her clothes with its fiery breath and carried off Prince Ronald. So there's that dragon carrying Prince Ronald and it used its fiery breath. Now she's naked It burnt off all her clothes. I guess that's how she lost her prince's clothes. I wonder what she's going to do. There goes Prince Ronald. Oh, no. Elizabeth decided to chase the dragon and get Ronald back. She looked everywhere for something to wear, but the only thing that she could find that was not burnt was a paper bag. So she put on the paper bag and followed the dragon. He was easy to follow because he left a trail of burnt forests and horses bones. So she wants to know where that dragon went and she's seeing this trail kind of like a road and look what happened. I'm thinking that maybe that dragon burnt all those trees with its fiery breath. Horses bones? Oh, do you think maybe that dragon is eating horses? That would be a really scary dragon if it's eating horses. I hope she doesn't get Bert following that dragon. That sounds really scary. Finally, Elizabeth came to a cave. Oh, there's a cave, a big hole in the earth, with a large door that had a huge knocker on it. She took hold of the knocker and banged on the door. The dragon stuck his nose out of the door and said, mm, Well, a princess. I love to eat princesses, but I've already eaten a whole castle today. I'm a very busy dragon. Come back tomorrow. He slammed the door so fast that Elizabeth almost got her nose caught. So he shut that door really quickly. I guess I wonder what Elizabeth's going to do. I think Ronald's inside that cave with the dragon. I think maybe he is. How will he? How is she going to get Ronald with that big scary dragon there? Oh, what a problem. Elizabeth grabbed the knocker. Oh, there's the knocker. And banged on the door again. Dragon stuck his nose out of the door and said, Go away! I love to eat princesses, but I've already eaten a whole castle today. I'm a very busy dragon. I'm back tomorrow. So the dragon's telling her to go away. Wait, shouted Elizabeth. Is it true that you are the smartest and fiercest dragon in the whole world? Oh, oh, yes, said the dragon. That's curious. She's asking the dragon if he's smart and fierce. Fierce is like, like if you're really tough and mean and strong. I wonder why she's asking him about that. What a curious thing to do. Is it true, said Elizabeth, that you can burn up 10 forests with your fiery breath? <clears throat> oh, yes, said the dragon. And he took a huge breath, deep breath, <clears throat> and breathed out so much fire that he burnt up 50 forests. Look at all that fire coming out of his mouth, and he's burning up all the forests. That's the trees, right? I wonder why she's asking him to burn up forests. Fantastic, said Elizabeth. That means that's really quite impressive. Amazing. Wow. And the dragon took another huge breath. 
and breathed out so much fire that he burnt out a hundred forests. Magnificent, said Elizabeth. She said, wow. And the dragon took another huge breath. But this time, nothing came out. The dragon didn't even have enough fire left to cook the meatball. Hmm. The dragon use up all its fire? Hmm. That's interesting. Elizabeth said, Dragon, is it true that you can fly around the world in 10 seconds? Flying around the world would be a, would be really take a long time. It would take me days to drive around the world, but he's going to fly around the world in 10 seconds. Let's see if the dragon can do it. Oh, why, yes, said the dragon. And he jumped up and flew all the way around the world in just 10 seconds. He was very tired when he got back. But Elizabeth shouted, fantastic, do it again. So the dragon jumped up and flew around the whole world in just 20 seconds. He got back, he was too tired to talk. And he lay down and went straight to sleep. Elizabeth whispered very softly. The dragon didn't move at all. She lifted up the dragon's ear and put her head right inside. She shouted as loud as she could, Hey, dragon! The dragon was so tired, he didn't even move. <gasps> the dragon fell asleep. I wonder what Elizabeth's going to do now that the dragon's asleep. What do you think she'll do? Let's see. Elizabeth walked right over to over the dragon and opened the door to the cave. She's inside the cave now, and there's Ronald. Hooray! There was Prince Ronald. He looked at her and said, Elizabeth, you are a mess. You smell like old ashes. She smells like he's saying, you smell like fire. Your hair is all tangled. See, it's not combed smooth, is it? It's all messy and tangled. And you're wearing a dirty old paper bag. Come back when you are dressed like a real princess. So she's rescuing him and he's just telling her that, he's, that she's messy. Hmm, I wonder what Elizabeth will do about that. I wonder how she's feeling right now. Let's see. Ronald, she said, your clothes are really pretty and your hair is very neat and you look like a real prince, but you are a bum. They didn't get married after all. So she rescued him, but they didn't get married. We'll have to think about that, won't we? That's really interesting. But first, you know what I wanted to think about with you? I noticed something in this story. I noticed that when Elizabeth got to the cave, she asked the dragon to make fire and burn down the forests. And then she asked him to fly around the world. I wonder why she did those things. I wonder why she didn't just say, give me back Prince Ronald. But instead, she said those things. Hmm, that's curious. Who has an idea about that? Okay, I won't ask you about your ideas. You're high comprehenders, so you probably got that figured out. So let's just take a moment, and, and I'm not going to do this in breakout rooms. I'm seeing people putting comments in the chat. So um, let's see what we've got to, uh, that some folks have shared here. What did you notice that seemed effective to you? Um, created anticipation before opening the book. I appreciate, uh, Teresa, you bringing attention to what happened before the book, uh, before the story, because what we do before matters a lot, okay? Uh, Kristen mentions um, different voices to stay interested. Teresa also mentions voices. Okay, uh, we've got some different um, about how um, that, and I would describe that as at least in part reading with expression and, and Kristen ties that to interest and Teresa mentions showing fear and excitement. So I wanna hold on to, we've got 
two things going on with those voices. One is, it's interesting when somebody is going, hey, right? But also those voices show aspects of the character's thoughts and feelings, don't they, right? Mara, yeah, the dragon can have him. He's a bum, right? Uh, attention to empathy. Oh, now Jessica's got us thinking about another aspect of comprehension here, asking questions to engage them in what's going on. And and um, we're seeing also that, uh, Tlemar, I hope I'm saying your name right, um, that, uh, that I was doing explaining um, of the story, using the pictures to do that. And Carol noticed that that I was simply doing some explaining at some parts as well. Um, Colleen noticed think alouds, talking about unfamiliar words. So, and, and Mara's got us attending to climate change, absolutely. Um, the I wonder, that's one of those words that sort of gets kids focused on a problem in the story. Um, Antoinette mentions the explaining as well and asking questions. Explaining vocabulary, yeah. And, and Danielle pausing. So um, feelings, hand gestures. So you folks have really described a, a really, I think, pretty extensive um, set of strategies that we can use to help kids understand the story, be engaged in it, and learn new words. And you know that's kind of what this is what this is all about. So let me see if I can take what you've described right there and 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 attach it to some things. All right. So you know we'd said that this is what we had going on. And 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 let's play with this idea of of, of vocabulary words as, as a first start. And, and what I'd like to do in order to do that is to take another book and have us look at it and simply do some identifying of words that would um, th that we might support, okay? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna share with us a few pages from this book, Too Many Tamales, maybe some of you know it. And as we look at them, let's focus first just on the vocabulary, all right? And, uh, as, we, uh, and as we come across words in the book that might need some support, let's see if we can name them, either come out, uh, out loud or put them in the chat. Elba's already found our first one, tamales, right? Um, some kids are very acquainted with that, others not. Okay, so, and I'm not gonna try reading with expression or comprehension here, we're just gonna focus on finding vocabulary. So here's the first page. Snow drifted through the streets, and now that it was dusk, Christmas trees glittered in the windows. Oh yeah, there we are, page one. We've already got three words, right? Dusk, glittered, yep, okay. Um, drifted, all right. So uh, I think, you know, what I'd highlight here is we start taking these books and once we slow down and look, there's lots of words that four-year-olds aren't gonna know or five-year-olds even, right? So let's go to the next page. Mara, uh, I'm sorry, Maria moved her nose off the glass and came back to the counter. She was acting grown up now, helping her mother make tamales. Their hands were sticky with masa. That's very good, her mother said. So we've got counter, we've got masa. All right, absolutely. Maria hap uh, um, happily kneaded the masa. She felt grown up wearing her mother's apron. Her mother had even let her wear lipstick and perfume. If only I could wear mom's ring, she thought to herself. Oh my gosh, look at all these words, right? Needed, perfume, grown up. Thank you for that, Elba. That, that phrase looks simple, but like what, what's grown up and what's it mean to feel grown up? So I wanna just pause right here for a second. On this um, pair of pages, we've got like half a dozen words that kids don't know, right? And so I, I wanna highlight two things about that. One is for kids to be successful with this book, if we're gonna read this book, we're gonna to have to give them some support in understanding those words. Otherwise, I mean, we know what's gonna happen, right? They won't understand and they'll disengage. So we're gonna to need to offer vocabulary support. The other thing though, for, quite frankly, is we can't, if, if we try to sort of slip information about six words into two pages of reading, we're gonna kill this story, aren't we? And, and hopefully what you saw me do was to model sort of slipping information in about the words. Um, 
that, so that the story didn't shut down. And frankly, what, what we're going to have to do if we're reading this book is we're going to have to decide which of those words are the most important ones for them to know on this page and think about providing some support for those particular words. Um, I'm going to tell you, if you don't know this story, um, one of those words is going to be needing, actually, because of what happens with that ring. All right. So um, that would be one. Uh, it might be um, less important for the word counter to be known by kids, for example, because I mean, not that it isn't a valuable vocabulary word, but if we're making choices, it doesn't play as large a role in what goes on in this story. Whereas to spoil the story, uh, Maria ends up thinking that she lost the ring down in the masa. So kids are going to need to know masa and they're going to need to know needed just to sort of preview how this how this ends up ends up working. So we've got some other words there like apron, great word on a first read. I'm not going to attend to that word. And lipstick also, you know, useful word. I'm, I'm probably going to let it go because I don't want to drag it down by doing every word. So here's the next page. And here's where we start getting into um, what's going on. Maria's mother had placed her diamond ring on the kitchen counter. Maria, oh, maybe we do need counter. I forgot that it shows up again. But this might be an easier page to define it because now we can just point to that counter and, and you know, um, to explain that. Maria loved the ring. She loved how it sparkled like their Christmas tree lights. When her mother left the kitchen to answer the telephone, Maria couldn't help herself. She wiped her hands on the apron and looked back at the door. Hmm. Yeah, sparkled, and we've got apron here again, and we've got, um, what else? Um, uh, wiping, perhaps? I don't know. Oh, kids probably know wiping. They're spilling so much, right? Um, the phrase couldn't help herself is an interesting one. Oh, yeah, Elba got that. Yeah, yeah, I, I'm with you on that. I think that that would be a challenging one for kids and one that's like, important in this story. She couldn't help herself. So she knows she shouldn't take that ring, but she can't stop herself, right? I'll wear the ring for just a minute, she said to herself. The ring sparkled on her thumb. So once again, that word sparkled shows up twice. This might be a really good place to define it because there aren't so many other words. And because, I mean, there it is right on her finger. You can't miss it, right? Okay. Maria returned to kneading the masa, her hands pumping up and down. On her thumb, the ring disappeared, then reappeared in the sticky glob of dough. Her mother turned and, um, turned and took the bowl from her. Go get your father from this part, for this part, okay? So here we've got the word kneading coming back. We've got masa coming back. Um, disappeared and reappeared, glob, yep, okay. Then the three of them began to spread masa onto corn husks. Maria's father helped by plopping a spoonful of meat into the center. Corn husks, yeah, plopping. And folding the husk, he then placed them in a large pot on the stove. They made 24 tamales as the windows grew white with delicious smelling curls of steam. So, um, let me just pause here with you for a moment and think some about what we do with some of the, actually, you know what? I, I'm, I'm gonna do just a couple more pages first because that'll help us. So let me do that. Um, a few hours later, the family came over with arms full of bright presents. Her grandparents, her uncle and aunt, and her cousins, Dolores, Teresa, and Danny. Maria kissed everyone hello. Then she grabbed Dolores by the arm and took her upstairs to play with the other cousins tagging along after them. Maybe tagging along would be one there, right? Okay. So they cut out pictures from newspapers, pictures of toys um, they were hoping were wrapped and sitting under the Christmas tree. As Maria was snipping out a picture of a pearl necklace, a shock spread through her body. So maybe... Snipping, shock. The ring, she exclaimed. Everyone stared at her. What ring, Dolores asked. Without answering, Maria ran to the kitchen. Here's the last page I'm going to share with you. 
The steaming tamales lay on a platter. The ring is inside the, one of the tamales, she thought to herself. It must have come off when I was kneading the masa. Can we see how crucial kneading the masa is here? Dolores, Teresa, and Danny skipped into the kitchen behind her. Help me, Maria cried. They looked at each other. Danny piped up first. What do you want us to do? Eat them, she said. If you bite something hard, tell me. <laughs> so you and I get the inference here, right? That ring's got to be in this corn house, in the, in the masa somewhere. So now we've got a whole zillion words going here, right? I want to just take a couple and think with you about what we would do to help kids define them. And, and because kneading and masa have become so critical, let's go back to that page where they first show up and think about what could we do when the, we come up with those words to help kids understand those words. Maria happily kneaded the masa. Kneaded is especially confusing because they've got another word need in mind probably, right? N-E-E, -E, right? How could we explain kneading? Ah, Christine says, it, like playing with Play-Doh. Okay, so we could explain kneading. Kneading is like when you're pushing on the Play-Doh, right? Okay, ah, and Anne says demonstrate. Okay, so use our bodies to demonstrate kneading with, uh, and Marisa, show with your hands, model it, absolutely, okay? And Elsie, um, we need to get real masa at some point here, don't we? Yeah, we'd have to think about whether we wanted to get that out during the story, but perhaps be, uh, before or after. What I wanna highlight for you here is that, that when, a word shows up in a story that is such a powerful place to give information about it because then they get it within the story context, which builds extra information. And um, Tlemar, uh, what I'm hearing, you're really adding something here by, by pointing us, I think, to the illustration, looking her, at her with her hands in the bowl, right? So you do kneading, put your hands in the bowl, like stirring with the spoon. You're, you've got your hands in there, mixing it around. So I wanna notice what we just did there. There are essentially three strategies that we can use anytime a word shows up, okay? Uh, that we wanna help kids with. Um, and I'm gonna, I'll stay, you know what? I'll jump ahead here and then come back to that page. You, uh, let's see, we can, point to the pictures, we can act it out, or we can tell the meaning. I use point, act, tell, because the little acronym I use there, P-A-T, I think of it as padding the vocabulary. We can point to that picture. We can you know, point down to Maria with her hands down in that bowl. That's giving the kids information about that word. We can act it out. A number of you described like um, pushing with our hands or, or um, you know, showing with our hands, modeling it, or we can tell, we can, in effect, give a, a definition, right? We can say kneading is when you push on something to mix it up, or another way to give a definition is to say it's like, okay? And it's like when you play with Play-Doh, okay? It's to give an example, so, so pointing, use that illustration. Acting, use your body, use your face. Okay? Telling, give a definition or, um, or, or give an example in effect, right? Okay, so um, um, we can, um, you, essent, those are essentially the strategies that we have to use over and over. So what, where I wanna land with you right here is that when we're thinking of supporting vocabulary in a storybook, we essentially just do what we did. We go through that book we, uh, be, before we read it. We identify words where children might experience challenges, and we think about what we could do during that read to give children some kind of information about what that word means, um, either by pointing, acting, or telling. Let me give you a couple examples here of teachers doing this in their classroom, okay? Just so you can sort of see it in action. Um, this is a teacher reading the book, I Stink, and she's on a page where the words reverse and barge come up. So here we go. He's going to the river. Is he gonna put all that garbage right in the water? Yeah! Hey, is that a good idea? No, I think he's putting it right inside that bin. Yeah, I think right there. Right inside there? 
Oh, the lights flash. The driver go in reverse. Look how he's driving. He's going backwards. Reverse means to go backwards. Fly, because get me to the barge. And hear my flash. So, Dallas, you were right. They're going to put the garbage on that. It's called a barge. A barge is a great big flat boat that they can put things on to carry it down the river. Okay, so she used um, the illustration to point out the barge. Um, so that's the that's the pointing, right? She um, did some telling. She gave a definition for reverse. She also gave a definition for a barge. Barge is a great big flat boat. So that just leaves us acting out. So let's go to uh, another example. Come on, give me some gas. Yes. Rev me to the max. Let's rev up that engine. Ready? <laughs> So we all just acted out revving. So um, what I want to highlight here is that my guess is there's nothing there that you haven't done before, right, or thought about before. But what I want to encourage is, is us really being intentional about identifying vocabulary and thinking, how can I effectively provide enough information to give kids a, really a first scaffold on this word so that they not only learn the word, but can use it to make some meaning in the story. Okay, so let me pause just there for a moment. Um, give you just a, a second with that. And if there are any comments, questions, um, we can attend to those. And then we're going to think some about comprehension. Okay, let's jump to comprehension. And I want to say something. I don't. I, I always encourage us to think of children as capable. I also think it's important that we understand sort of where they are, right? That for us to successfully scaffold, we have to understand what they're, what they're, um, sort of the way they're thinking about things. And and I think one of the things that I've certainly experienced in my own work with children and that research supports is that children ages three, four, five, six, uh, comprehending stories is considerably more challenging than it looks like from the outside. They don't always have a clear idea of what's happening. Okay? They like, um, they, you know, how do the events connect? That isn't always obvious to them. Um, they may misinterpret um, illustrations. Um, interpret them in ways that, that we certainly wouldn't. Um, they often um, can have difficulty reading the, the character's feelings and understanding, um, sort of getting inside, having those empathy experiences with characters. And, and so they don't then get why the characters did what they did, and they don't see the causal relations. Now, some kids are great at this, okay? And they're the ones that when you're reading a a, 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 um, a, a you know, an engaging story and doing it in an engaging way, they're like this, right? Because they get caught up in it. And, you know, for, for some kids, they could sit there and read a story for 30 minutes with us if we if we had that kind of time, because um, they're fascinated and they're understanding. But for the kids who, who are struggling with that comprehension, then what happens is they feel unsuccessful. They're not following the line of, of, of what's going on and they stop listening and they check out, okay? And the immediate consequence for us is those are often the kids that are acting up during the story, okay? The, the longer term consequence is they are not actually the, getting the same benefits from the story read that the other kids are, which is why, um, you know, we do all that heavy lifting about supporting story comprehension. So what I tried to do in that story was Something, some things at the beginning, some things in the middle, and some things at the end, okay? Um, and Christine, just describe for us uh, a, a technique for assisting kids in comprehending there. Thank you, pointing out the facial expressions. So let's hang on to that because that's gonna be really useful when we get into the stories themselves. So here's what I did. Think back for a moment to what I did introducing that story, The Paper Bag Princess. I focused on the princess and the dragon, right? And I actually kind of gave away part of the story, didn't I? But what some of you described there was that I sort of created a little bit of suspense. 
I created a reason to read the story. So we've got some engagement. I also helped kids focus on the problem of the story. The, you know, you and I, we, you know, we get, we'll focus on like the main idea in a story. Kids won't necessarily. They may be focused on, oh, wow, that's a lot of fire. And they may be remembering some other movie that has a dragon in it. Or we may start talking about the princess in some other movie or whatever. And what we want to do is we want to focus on, ooh, this, this is a princess with a problem. And if they get that problem, or as um, as Mara says, a fire at their house, absolutely. Um, and and so we want them to focus on that problem. Mara, you bring up something else that that I that I want to be um, very explicit that I didn't do. Okay, I did not ask children about their experiences with dragons, princesses, fire, whatever. Okay, now. Obviously, none of them are princesses. None of them have actually encountered dragons. So it's not like if you read a book about a brother and a sister or something, right? But they have had experiences with dragons and princesses in movies and so on. The problem with, with asking them about that, with, with surfacing all of that, um, is that then that's what's in their head. And if that's useful for the story, great. But sometimes it isn't. So let me just give you an example here. Sometimes... Um, People would do picture walks, okay? So we do a, I don't know what kids would say with a picture walk with this story, but let's just, let's do some pretending. Oh, there's a princess um, and he's a sports guy. Okay, I don't know, all right? What they'll say, ooh, she's naked. That'll be the thing on this page, right? And ooh, she's really angry. Um, I bet she's gonna beat up that dragon, okay? Now, I don't know what, will happen from there, but let's just say one kid says, she's gonna beat up the dragon, okay? Says, what do you think, isn't this something we do? We say, what do you think will happen, okay? Well, this is actually a researched issue that like, if you activate that kind of experience for kids and they make those kinds of predictions, young kids have a difficult time adjusting their thinking. Their cognitive flexibility is not their strength. And so if it's planted in kids' heads, she's gonna beat up that dragon, some kids are going to be looking for that all the way through the story. And some of the research indicates that at the end of the story, if you ask kids what happened and you say, did she beat up the dragon? A bunch of kids are going to say yes, because that's, you know, they've got that lane to go down. So um, predictions are really useful and prior knowledge are really useful when they point kids towards what's happening in the story. When they point kids in other directions, it's actually difficult for kids to come back to where the story is. So I focused on the problem in the story, the main character, the problem in the story, and then let's jump in. And then in the story, I used basically the three things that we've got to support kids understanding the story. We've basically got three tools. One is um, reading with expression. And I wanna highlight that for a moment because lots of times we think of reading with expression as being basically about um, having the story be entertaining. And that's true, it does make it entertaining. But when I, uh, let's see, when I read this story, let me find a part here. Um, When I read this story and I say, is it true, said Elizabeth, that you can burn up 10 forests with your fiery breath? And then for the dragon, I go, oh, yes. Okay. How is that dragon feeling? I mean, my expression made that dragon out to be a bit of a braggart, right? A, a boaster, a very proud, right? Which is key in this story because what Elizabeth does is take advantage of his pride, right? Isn't that how she gets him to become exhausted? So, so when you read with expression, it's not only engaging, it helps the readers understand the characters, right? When I was reading Ronald's part and I went, Elizabeth, you are a mess. You smell like ashes. We can, I mean, who doesn't get that he's a jerk, right? So, so reading with expression actually supports comprehension. 
making comprehension comments. A number of you noticed that where I paused along the way, and we'll have some more to say about that. And referring to the illustrations, like I used the 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 um, the picture of the knocker and the picture of the cave and you know the fiery forests and the trail and so on so that we're using the, the illustrations and pointing to aspects of the illustrations so they can understand so let's take just a moment on reading with expression okay um i imagine we all do this to at least some extent and i really want to just encourage you to grab a hold of reading with expression because first off it's fun but secondly, for the kids, it does help them understand. And you actually have five tools that you can use when you read with expression. One is your voice. Okay? This is an angry character. Okay. Another is your gestures. <gasps> right. Uh, whatever. Another is your body. How you, you can actually move, like with your kneading, you know, the way you move your body. Your face. You can look surprised. You can look, you can look nervous. You can, <gasps> You can look scared. You can use your face to communicate information and then the pace at which we read, right? Hey, dragon. Okay. Versus, hey, dragon. Right? So we use pace to communicate feelings as well. So I want you like to think of yourself as an actor or actress and use those, just like step into that. Aaron says, loves getting into character and, and, yeah, it's more fun for us. It's more fun for the kids. And it's not just a show. It's also a message. Those are messages about the characters and the events. Okay, so let's just take a minute here. And, and um, this is a page that this is the next page. Well, no, it's not the next page. This is a, a page further on in the story that um, of, of um, too many tamales. So what happens in too many tamales there is you saw Maria thinks, oh my gosh, the ring is in the tamales. And so she says to her brothers and sisters, we got to eat them till we find till we find that ring. So they start eating the tamales. No ring. They eat all the way through the tamales. They eat all 24 tamales. The kids do. And they don't find the ring. So here's the page. And, and here's the way it just reads, right? Nothing. Didn't any of you bite something hard, Maria asked? How's Maria feeling at that point? I mean, desperate, ashamed, panicked, right? So how would we read that sentence? How would Maria say, didn't any of you bite something hard? Anybody want to come off mute for us and be a desperate, panicked, fearful Maria? What's that sound like? Disappointed? Yeah, disappointed Maria too, absolutely. You've listened to me a lot. Let's hear somebody else's voice. Uh, I'll do it. Thanks, Marissa. Yeah, no problem. Uh, didn't any of you bite something hard? Who listen to the way her voice went up on hard? Yeah, like you can hear that in her voice, right? So, so, so when Maria, Marissa's reading this, she doesn't need to pause and say, "Oh, Maria's really worried that she didn't find it." Her voice just gave that, right? Okay. So then Danny frowned, and then, you know, how would Danny say that next line? Maybe he'd say, "I think I swallowed something hard." Now, how is Maria going to say swallowed it? Anybody want to give us that one? Oh, all right, I'll do it. I'll do Swall it. Oh, go for it, Rosie. Thanks. Yeah. Swallow swallowed it? Oh, like, oh, no. Could you hear the oh, no in her voice, right? We don't need to say, oh, no, because Rosie just said, swallowed it? Yeah, like she can't believe it, right? So then, you know, we go on from there. But it, and all I want to highlight here is that, like, when she read that, yes, we're engaged. And it told all the listeners how Maria is feeling, okay? We can look at the picture and look at her feelings, or we can hear it in her voice, too, all right? So... Um, 
enough on reading with expression. The second of the, of, of the comprehension strategies is really um, making comments right, as we go along. And a number of you noted how I did that in the paper bag princess, okay? And what, what I wanna suggest that you do is a, a couple of things on there. One is you think about like, where might the kids get stuck? Where might they need an explanation? And sometimes it's when something's not clear. Sometimes it might be in some kind of a sequence. And when those things come up, just slow down and take a little bit of time and play with them. And and, and, and a way of thinking about that then is to notice what is going on in your own head, okay? So, so when, when you get to this page, if you haven't read this story already, aren't you thinking, oh my gosh, here's this little skinny princess in a flammable <laughs> piece of clothing. And there's a dragon whose head is bigger than she is. What in the heck is she going to do here, right? So that's what I'm wondering as like an ideal reader. I wouldn't say all that to the kids, but I would say, and I think I did say something like, I wonder how she's going to get Ronald away from that dragon, right? Because that's what you're doing, right? So we can name some of the strategies that go into that. What I just used right there was a question. Okay? I wonder, and those those are those are pretty powerful. But they're they're not the only way in. Okay, so uh, another way in is to do some some summarizing. So one of the things that is um, that that is an interesting pattern in this book that in fact I um, brought up in the question at the end was to say, oh look what she did. She when she got to the dragon's cave, first she asked him if he could burn down forests. And he could, but it made him really tired. And then she asked him if he could fly around the world. And he could, but it made him so tired, he fell asleep. Well, that's actually a really interesting sequence in that book. And by doing that summarizing there, the kids can see the connections. That in fact, this isn't just one event and another event, is it? That we've got this Elizabeth being very purposeful about tricking this dragon. So when I do summarizing, I make something, you know, I, I can make a a pattern or a flow or connections obvious in a story that might not be otherwise, okay? Um, explaining, I did some explaining back here where you know she was angry and she's gonna try to follow the dragon and she'll be able to know where to go because there's a trail, right? So there are various ways to sort of make these comprehension comments um, as, uh, as um, um, support for kids. Uh, Mara? Comments, even though she didn't end up liking him, she saved him anyway instead of being vindictive. This is actually, when you start digging into the characters, this is actually a pretty complex story, right? So um, she did save him. Um, he was still a jerk. Um, and uh, so what do we, I mean, an, an interesting thing to explore would might be like, oh, so... What do you think happened next in this story, right? So let's take just a moment and think about comprehension comments. And let's go to a moment in this story that's kind of big time about uh, making sense in this story. Remember this page where um, Maria suddenly went, the ring, okay? The ring, she screamed, everyone stared at her. What ring, Dolores asked, without answering, Maria ran to the kitchen. Now, what's going on here? You and I know what's going on here, right? Maria is saying the ring because she's thinking, well, what's she thinking? She's thinking, where is it? It's not on my finger, right? She, and, you know, Maria was snipping out a picture of a pearl necklace. Okay, thinking about jewels, 
a shock spread through her body, the ring. You and I know what's going on here. Do you think all the kids in your class are going to get that when she says the ring, she's thinking, oh my gosh, I had my mom's ring on my finger. Now I don't. I wonder where it is. I hope it's in the kitchen, right? She's worried because she realized the ring wasn't on her finger. Now, I want to be really clear about something. You get that instantly as a reader, right? That is an easy thing for you to understand. But that is an inference. That's a conclusion that you're reaching by thinking about the sequence of the story. There is no place on that page where it says Maria suddenly realized that she had had the ring on her finger and now she doesn't, and now she doesn't know where it is, okay? That's key to this story and it never says it in the book, okay? So somehow if we want all the kids in our class to follow this story, we've got to slow down and make that obvious for them. How might you do that? Any thoughts? <laughs> yeah, Mara's afraid her mom's going to punish her. She, I mean, you lose your mom's wedding ring, you're in trouble, right? So we might ask them questions about what they think. Why is she saying the ring? Okay. And there might be some child who can describe that for us. Okay, That's pos possible. Okay. It's also possible we might get stuck at that at some point. And you've always got a call to make on that. Is this a moment where like a constructivist approach of having the learning come out of the children is going to be effective? Or is this tough enough that we might want to like help help the kids unpack it? So um, we might, um, Mariah is saying you lost your mom's phone. What do you think would happen to you? Absolutely. And, and, and we might, but, but I want to be, I want to highlight here that we might actually have to get kids to understand that she thinks the ring is lost and that she lost it. And so we might need to say, even go back in the story and say, oh, let me see, where did I put my books? You might even want to do something this explicit. You know, you know your kids, you make a call, but okay. she had the ring on her finger, remember? And then she put her hands back in the masa and was kneading the masa. And now the ring isn't on her finger. I wonder where, she, where it is. I wonder where Maria thinks it is. She ran back down to the kitchen. Where do you think it is? Okay. Well, then the next page helps us out with that, where she says, it must have come off when I was kneading the masa, all right? So now we've got that information, but we might wanna support them at that moment. So there's not a formula on this, okay? What I, just basically what I wanna to describe to you is when, you, when you're reading the story, notice the places where children might be confused or not get it, especially the crucial um, plot points. And that's a crucial one, right? And take the time to slow down and think about how can I make it clear to kids what's going on here so that they'll understand, all right? And some of you are using kids' background knowledge. That's terrific. I also really want to encourage you to use the cues that are in the book, okay? I was, it was intentional that what I did was I went back in the story. And I'd encourage you to like use the story as much as you can to help kids figure out what's going on in any particular moment. Because, you know, stories are kind of their own world on that. And sometimes our background knowledge is helpful. Other times the information is gonna be here. So let's make sure we use the story as well. All right. So um, the last thing that I did was, I didn't just say, wasn't that a nice story? Who likes to eat tamales? Instead, I asked the higher order thinking question. I asked uh, an analytical question. Um, so what I, you know, and, and the purpose here is to help kids think more deeply about the story. And um, with um, too many, with um, the paper bag princess, I went back and focused on that sequence because 
that's where we see Elizabeth being especially um, clever, I guess you could say brilliant. In fact, oh, I need to trick a dragon. Here's how I'm going to trick a dragon. And so um, helping kids focus on that. Um, here are a couple examples of those kinds of questions that I've seen teachers do for this book, Too Many Tamales. Okay. I remember Maria was playing upstairs with her cousins and then she ran to the kitchen. Why did she run to the kitchen? Well, like we just focused on, the story doesn't say that. Um, but what we can do is make inferences together with the kids from that. Or Maria's family had cooked up the tamales for the holiday, but then Maria told her cousins to eat them. Why did Maria tell her cousins to eat them? So helping kids look at, um, I mean, those are both why questions. Uh, why are they feeling sick? Absolutely. And so uh, we've got a couple things going on here. One is simply by asking higher order thinking questions. We are asking kids to do more than recall. Okay. Comprehension is not just remembering the story. It's making sense of the story. So we want to, we do want to intentionally ask kids, you know, those um, uh, um, analytical um, uh, type questions. And the other piece of that is that, you know, we just build those skills when um, when we do that. So, uh, oh, there's an interesting question. What do you think the family's going to eat now? What are they going to do? Absolutely. So um, that would be a great question where kids get to sort of think about, oh, what do we know about this family? What would be their options? What could they do? Could they make more tamales? Or they want to make something else. Maybe the kids are sick of tamales. You know, and so those kinds of questions help kids make inferences. And that's a key comprehension skill on its own. And that's how you get a deeper knowledge of the story, which is what it's about. All right. Those of you who use creative curriculum, I don't know if any of you do, but it is the most widely used curriculum. So I'll mention this. One of the things that comes with your curriculum is a resource called book discussion cards. Those book discussion cards essentially pretty much use the strategies that I've just described. Um, the, the lead author on those um, book discussion cards, uh, let's see if I have the resource in here, is a woman, um, well, no, I guess I don't have her name here. Um, don't need to worry about that. But anyway, a uh, professor at Ohio State who's been very prominent, um, Leah McGee, in developing the repeated interactive read aloud strategy. So what you're seeing me do here is very similar to what that um, resource will guide you to do. Um, so since you don't all have uh, creative curriculum, or even if you do, I encourage independent thinking, right? I would encourage you to make a plan before you read a story. And essentially, um, the plan, uh, making a plan would have three steps. First, read and analyze the story for vocabulary and comprehension. Think about the kids, where might they need help? And then make a plan. If you actually like to write a plan, um, there is a planning document that you can use that's in the um, handouts. Um, here, it's two pages that essentially has you do what um, we just did, which is to um, introduce the story by telling about the main characters, telling about the story problem, then um, analyzing the vocabulary, analyzing comprehension challenges, and thinking about a big why question for the end. Okay, so if that structure seems useful for you, here's a planning document. Um, I do want to highlight one thing that um, that uh, nobody commented on. I, I, um, that I did that I didn't do at the beginning. Did anybody notice that I didn't do the whole thing about the front of the book, the back of the book, the spine of the book, the author, and so on? And I just want to suggest that um, you know certainly there's a place for all those things, and there's some book knowledge. But I'd encourage you to think about if you want to do that on every story, because you know frankly it shouldn't take 200 stories for kids to learn that. And if we want kids to focus on the story, then let's talk about Let's focus on that right at the start of the book. So I'm um, not saying those other things are bad, but I do want to say, I want to encourage you to be intentional about how you introduce the story by focusing on the characters and the problems. Now, if we had another hour and a half, I would think with you about what to do on second and third reads, because you'll notice that the title of, of this sort of strategy is repeated interactive read-alouds, which means we're reading it some more times, right? 
I imagine many of you do read books more than once, right? That's great. And what I want to suggest is that if we have a really powerful first read, where frankly, we're doing a lot of scaffolding for kids on the first read, on the second and third reads, they can actually do a lot of the heavy lifting themselves. We can ask them questions about what will happen next. We can ask them questions about why the character um, is doing what they're doing. Um, I am not going to go into detail on strategies for that right now because we, we just don't have the time. But I will tell you that there are two resources one of which is free and another which is not free, but is excellent um, for, uh, for, those, for those strategies. Um, the one that's free is um, from a, a website called Reading Rockets, and it's titled Repeated Interactive Read Alouds in Preschool and Kindergarten. And um, you actually, I, I copied and pasted it and turned it into a handout for you. You have it as a handout as well. Um, so that is one of your handouts. Um, but the lead, the authors on that, Judy Shikadance and Leah McGee, are the best um, researchers and practitioners of this that I've run into anywhere. Um, I will I'll freely tell you that the reason I'm doing this with you is because I got to mentor under Judy Shikadance for years, and um, and and I, a lot of what I'm sharing with you is channeling um, channeling Judy. So. Um, the reading rockets on, on I agree, Courtney, that over and over reading rockets is an excellent resource. This is a go to one for interactive read loads. If you're into buying books on literacy, so much more than the ABCs by Judy Shikadatz and Molly Collins is an excellent early literacy resource, and it has a terrific chapter on repeated interactive read alouds. So um, with lots of information about um, second and third reads. Essentially what I wanna offer you on second and third reads is that in this first read, I was really scaffolding the children. I was doing a lot of the providing of information, but then in the second and third reads, we hand over more and more of the responsibility for the, for, uh, for the read to the kids because they know it and they can do it. All right. Um, I want to do one last um, thing with you, and that is I want to take a moment to just remember that we are working with many children from many different backgrounds. And part of what happens in books is not just that children develop literacy skills, but that they also have an experience both of seeing themselves, that's mirrors, and expanding their world, that's windows, and stepping into other worlds, right? That's sliding glass doors. And so I want to just encourage us as we do our readings that we think about, and you know, you've got some stuff in here that you're probably pretty familiar with, but that we think about who are the children in our classroom and what are the books that we need to bring in so that our children have that experience, not only of learning about places and people other than the ones they know, but also of, no, of the of the world that they're familiar with. And so I wanna just take a moment and, and I wanna just um, give us a chance to share some resources here. I want you to think about the kids that you work with, whatever their language background might be, cultural background, um, gender diversity, whatever that might be. And think about, are there particular books that you have found that really speak to um, some communities that might not be as represented? And just as a reminder that as of four years ago, anyway, um, uh, First Nations American uh, Native Americans were virtually absent from children's books. Um, there were far more bears as main characters than there were um, Latino children. And so, you know, can we name some of the books? All right, and we've got some titles going there. I encourage people to um, do some copying and pasting of what's in that chat box there as the titles come up. Carlin, thank you. Those Jabari titles are excellent. That's the one where Jabari is trying to jump into the pool, isn't it? Wonderful children's book. And also, um, uh, agreed, I love it. Um, uh, representing some characters who, who who don't show up as frequently. So um, be, I've got four titles right there that you might not be as familiar with. Octopus Stew is my current very favorite book, period. Oh, Hair Love, thank you. Yeah, great. The Lola books, okay. Uh, oh, I didn't know Sonia Sotomayor has a book, and Kamala Terrace. Don't Hug Doug. Oh, thank you. Yeah, um, I'd forgotten about that title. I'm going to write that one down. That's for... Um, 
I think uh, uh, neurodiverse children is are represented in that one, which which aren't as often. So thank you. Great. So um, seeing some titles here, I'm going to let you folks continue to add some titles to the chat as you as you think of those. And I'm going to offer us one last thought, and that is um, to just take a moment here and think about what we've what we've uh, worked on here for the last hour and a half, and. So, and just think about, are there some things that you're doing that you've sort of gotten as, as um, um, maybe a little refresher on? You're thinking, yeah, boy, that vocabulary work I do is really powerful. I'm going to keep doing it, maybe up my game a little, but keep doing that, going down that road. Or maybe there's something you're carrying away from this um, session that is new or different that you want to try. So um, I, I would encourage you to make a note because the most important part of this session is going to be what you do afterwards. So um, think about, um, think of, Courtney, thank you so much for that. We have a small community that's 99% white middle class, 100% English speakers. So offering like um, windows to your children means offering them some books from people in places that they might not encounter otherwise. Wonderful. Thank you. Bronzeville Boys and Girls. I don't know that. Thank you, folks. So let's write some titles and give you an opportunity to think about any last, um, any sort of commitments you might want to make about your work. And, um, oh, look at these titles. Man, I'm going to copy those down. Super, and there's my information. Please be in touch if that's helpful. And otherwise, um, to just wish you um, delightful reading with children. Um, the more engaging and understanding we are with them, the more they're motivated to read and understand and become the lifelong learners 